This is 1A. I'm Joshua Johnson visiting the Minnesota State Fair. If you've never been, go. It is worth the trip. Nearly 200,000 people visit every day. It's one of the busiest fairs in the nation, just outside the Twin Cities. This is where the state shows off its industry and agriculture, where people see livestock being born, and where you can eat every variation of anything fried known to man. <laughs> but there's much more to Minnesota than the fair. And there's much more to Minnesotans than women who are strong, men who are good-looking, and children who are above average. <laughs> People here pay close attention to the big issues, education, the environment, indigenous peoples, law enforcement, and more. Minnesotans are nice, but they're not numb. It's one of the nation's most politically dynamic states, led by a governor in the first year of his first term. Joining us live from the Minnesota Public Radio stage is Governor Tim Walz. He won this office after six terms in the U.S. House, representing a district in southern Minnesota. Governor Walz, welcome to 1A. Well, thank you for having me. And this, Welcome to the State Fair. Thank you for having us. And this interview is part of our Across America collaboration with public radio stations across the country. We're aiming to bring more local and regional perspectives into the national conversation. We'll take some questions from folks here at the fair, and we'd love to hear from you across Minnesota or the country. So email us, 1A at WAMU.org. Comment on our Facebook page or tweet us at 1A. Let's start just here at the fair. What makes this fair so special for someone who's never been here. Can you kind of encapsulate what makes this unique? Well, this fair, and I think the, the nickname of this fair, the Great Minnesota Get-Together, really does capture it. It's been around here for, uh, for 150 years. Uh, obviously started out highlighting a, an agricultural past and an agricultural industry, but it's grown into a place that uh, Minnesota's come, uh, I think, to express their pride, to express the, uh, the, uh, the sense that we're in this together. It is a diverse state from the Canadian border to, uh, down south to Iowa. Uh, we, uh, we produce as much corn and soybeans and, and agricultural products as any place in the world. Uh, we're leaders in, uh, in medicine with like the Mayo Clinic uh, and, and we're innovators in, in everything from education to computer technology. And I think the state fair is a place for us to gather and you're right, it's a, it's a Minnesota nice and uh, there's a Minnesota humbleness but there's also a sense of a lot of things work right here, and when you come to the State Fair, you feel that. So it's a, it's more than the food. Don't don't underestimate the food, but yeah. it is more than the food. It's more than just the exhibit. It's the sense of what it means to be part of a community and be part of a state. We are actually across the way from a booth that's selling uh, the original mini apple pie. There's uh, pork chops on a stick, chicken breasts on a stick, flowering onions. So if the odor wafts this way, to those of you <laughs> listening across the country, I already told a guy in the front row he's going to have to take over. One of the things that some of those soybeans are being used for is a kind of a bean ballot, the 2020 yeah. elections around the corner and it's one of those where you kind of drop a bean in a in a bucket to see who people are leaning towards for for their nomination how do you see that having gone so far and i'd be interested to know where you cast your bean yeah well i've cast my bean with with my senior senator amy klobuchar and i i say that in many people know and we have a lot of preferences we're big tent uh it's a big tent i say that because uh i've had the like so many of the folks here have seen a uh a progressive who knows that you need to make progress and and that idea of moving things forward but i think what's what's really great about it and what i i love seeing that is the diversity of thought and the number of candidates in in the democratic and and of course amy is the only dfler in the presidential race democratic farmer labor party um but i see great excitement i think it's overall to see this whether those are uh, whoever your pick is at this point in time there's a a very clear uh, sense of we need to get this right. Minnesota is very proud. I, I would say this that uh, that we take great interest. We have the highest percentage of voting of any state in the nation. There's uh, there's folks here that are trying to further that. And so what I would say is there is great interest, obviously, in the upcoming presidential election. But the great thing about Minnesota, and we talk about when people say, you know, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. Minnesotans take every election as the most important election because it matters from school board on up to the presidential. I should note, by the way, that Senator Klobuchar did qualify for the next debates, which take place on September 12th. Yeah. There will be another day of debates if more than 10 candidates qualify. Now, in 2016, Minnesota changes the way, changed the way it decides on candidates. It switched from a caucus system to a primary system. How do you see the impact of that? Well, I, and the caucuses are, are a 
part of our tradition and and i think watching people come out and get excited about it but the problem is is they happen in a in a february day and i know this it's snowy in the last time in 2016 folks are have a hard time getting off work it's hard to make sure we have the participation i think uh, going to a primary ensures that we have broader participation we have more people there but i don't underestimate we still caucus we'll still get together these are the folks that do the hard work a lot of times of the door knocking and it's not that others don't want to do it but it's hard sometimes when you're working. It's hard if you don't have the time. And, and to be very honest, a lot of people don't know where the gateway is into that. But a primary, I think, will bring more folks out. and You should get a, uh, a better representation where folks are at. How do you see Amy Klobuchar's path forward? I'm just looking at kind of a poll of polls, and she's, she's really struggling to make traction, at least in the polling. What do you think she needs to do to turn more people on, to excite more people to her and, and her campaign? Well, those who have been here, it, know that the senator uh, visits all 87 counties every year. She wins counties that, that Democrats have never won. She wins with numbers that Republicans have never seen. And I think her way forward, and this is hard in a national election, is it's that face-to-face, -face, that hard work, that retail politicking, and that name recognition. So we're still in a, a phase where we know one candidate, who that's going to be, and then we have a whole bunch of people articulating a whole lot of passion from a wide variety of issues that are hopes and dreams as well as complaints. And I think Senator Klobuchar's ability to distill those down, and, and I will go back to this point again, and, and these are all open for debate, but making progress and moving things forward is absolutely paramount. I don't want to sell short the idea of a fierce sense of urgency in the now and a fierce sense of a large vision, those have to be there, but there has got to be a way to start progressing and moving towards them. So here in Minnesota, um, if the federal government's not going to lead on health care, we got to figure out a way to make sure every single Minnesotan is insured. So we, we may not see, we can't wait for Medicare for all, and whether these, whether you think it's good or not, and you have an opinion on that, that, that's one thing. But the fact is, is that we've got folks waiting today to get insulin at an affordable price, to be able to get in and get preventative care. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at it that way. I think that's Amy's perspective. Move the ball forward to improve lives. I do want to talk more about some of those issues that affect Minnesotans' health care among them as we continue our conversation with Minnesota Governor Tim Walls. And we'll get to some audience questions in just a minute. But yesterday on this program, we heard from farmers across the country on how the trade war between the U.S. and China is disrupting their businesses. Many told us they're against the trade war. Some said they support it, seeing long long-term benefits in the future. Some said their support for President Trump has eroded. Others say it's steadfast. Talk about what's going on with Minnesota agriculture and how the state's holding up in the trade war, or whether the state is holding up. I mean, are, are things okay, or is it are things in trouble? They're strained. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I, I would, if, to put things in context, um, this state, obviously, agriculture being a key part of it, th this is the state of Norman Borlaug and the University of Minnesota and the Green Revolution. This is a state that has literally fed the world, clothed the world, and fueling the world. Uh, the innovations that have come out of this, the ability to have an affordable, abundant uh, food supply, a lot of that is centered right where you're at. And, and these are folks, again, this intersection of the ability to produce food, the ability to respond to markets where people want their food to talk to them, if you will, know where it comes from, know what's behind it. Uh, that, coupled with folks on the land, in my case, my mother, our farm, 131 years, that this is tradition that runs four, five, six generations deep, and they are willing to do their share. They were willing to say, there does need to be changes to these trade wars, and, and they acknowledge China's theft of intellectual property in some of those things did matter, but the idea that, that agriculture was weaponized in a trade war, again, if you're going to fight any conflict, uh, you got to have an outcome in mind. I don't think anyone knows what the outcome is supposed to be. We say this, better deals for America. Well, guess what the Chinese are saying? Better deals for China. That negotiation piece in the middle was missing, and what I will tell you, there is strain, a combination of low commodity prices unprecedented weather events uh, of climate impact mm -hmm. and the president's uh, pinballing around on what the goal is have left folks in a precarious spot. So what's at the top of your list, and we'll get to some of your questions in a minute, what's at the top of your list other than just ending the standoff for what the feds can do to help Minnesota right now? Is there one thing at the top? 
Well, yeah, they, well, they could get the deal done, but that's, that's not going to happen. We got a farm bill that when I was in Congress, we helped negotiate. But this goes back to, again, and I think you're seeing a phenomenon of this, and I think it's the genius of our system. The states are laboratories of democracy. Midwest governors are simply coming together and, and doing some of this on our own. A group of Midwest governors, myself included, will be traveling to Japan and South Korea to make sure we foster our trade agreements. We're going to be meeting with the top 30 companies in Japan to talk about trade potentials, things that are there, and entice them to think about relocating here, where we've got strong work ethic, good infrastructure, ways to make things happen. So I think the federal government, I, I understand constitutionally, and the executive branch has the role on trade, but the things the states can do is keep those trade relations open, keep working with our allies, keep showing them that we're ready to go, and, and fostering and strengthening uh, abilities that, and, and channels that are open. Plenty of questions we want to get to from our audience here at the Minnesota State Fair. Derek in Minneapolis had a question about recession. Derek, why don't you make your way to one of the mites, and Joan from Mankato, am I saying that right? Mankato? Oh, thank God. Joan from Mankato, why don't you go to the other mic? I have done so many of these. Are you on telling the road. me everybody in America cannot pronounce Mankato? Dude, there are so many right. things. I learned so much <laughs> about pronunciation on the road. We're going to learn more about Minnesota as we continue our conversation with Governor Tim Walls. We welcome your questions here across Minnesota or anywhere across the country, 1A at WAMU.org. I'm Joshua Johnson, glad to be with you from the Minnesota State Fair. You are listening to 1A from WAMU and NPR. This is 1A. I'm Joshua Johnson at the Minnesota State, pa State Fair. We're talking politics with Minnesota Governor Tim Walls. We welcome your questions. Comment on our Facebook page, tweet us at 1A, or email 1A at WAMU.org. We'll get to some questions from folks here at the fair in just a minute. But ahead of our trip, we asked our listeners to weigh in on some of the issues that concerned them. One thing that kept coming up was this controversy over mining in the Boundary Waters watershed, which is in northern Minnesota. There's a company that's applying for permits to mine in part of the Superior National Forest, which includes Boundary Waters. One of our listeners wrote, what sort of safeguards will be in place to guarantee the Boundary Waters will be protected if copper mining goes forward? Governor? And the, those of you, the listeners out there, the folks that are sitting here in the audience knows this, that, that Minnesota has uh, some of the most beautiful uh, natural resources. We possess about 20% of the world's fresh water. Uh, we have uh, two of the most spectacular wild places, I would argue, on the planet uh, between the Boundary Waters Canoe Area and Voyagers National Park. And uh, this is an issue that is always at tension, uh, the idea of economic growth and activity versus preservation of the environment. And it so happens that uh, some of the world's richest deposits of rare earth metals, especially copper nickel, are located in many times in wet environments. And the folks that are in Minnesota are well versed on this. Uh, when you expose these minerals to the air and to water, sulfide runoff is, is an incredibly dangerous proposition. Uh, around the planet, uh, there are numerous cases of these things not working out right. But here's the challenge. Minnesota's northern uh, tier, the Iron Range, has been a longtime producer that literally built this country in taconite and, and iron ore. And the opportunities that are being seen in these metals, and of course the, the conundrum lies in this, that especially copper is, is a big part of a clean energy economy. Here in Minnesota, I put forward a proposal, um, the most aggressive in the nation, to move us to a carbon-free future by 2050 in our electrical generation. That Minnesota understands climate change is real, the threats to our environment are potentially be catastrophic, but the copper that's used, there's 5.5 tons in every megawatt of solar. Um, there's 180 pounds in every Tesla automobile. And the use of those metals is part of what we need to do to transition. So the conundrum we're in, it's a job creator, it's an opportunity to do this. It moves us because again, you can't say you want a clean energy economy and say we're gonna let them mine it horrifically in Chile or Brazil or yeah. wherever else using child labor. So the controversy and the question got asked is, the state has to follow the science, has to follow the process, and has to follow the law. We need to make sure that every single environmental protection is put in place and that a backstop on a financial uh, assurances and liability is in place before anything is done. Now, now does that mean that the state is ready to kind of go it alone if the federal government 
won't help. I mean, just today it was reported that the Trump administration is set to announce more environmental rollbacks, this time yeah. on methane regulation. So no. there's only so much That's right. that you can do in the power of the state before the feds no, say, no, 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 you're in our, you're in our territory. No, and I, I said the rollback, and, and I served in Congress for 12 years and fought these things. The rollback of the Endangered Species Act is, is ludicrous, that these are things in place. I oftentimes, uh, not too long ago, I went out to Farm Fest, and I heard people talking about the need to roll back the Endangered Species Act, and then I told them the story of the beautiful bald eagle flying over New Ulm that is a direct result of us limiting DDT exposure in the Endangered Species Act to bring back our national symbols. So we in Minnesota, we're not going to do it alone. We certainly need help. The process for permitting these, and there are two different mines with Northern Metals that is in the beginning process, and the PolyMet mine that has all of its permits issued prior to uh, myself and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan coming to office. Right. But I own the responsibility of putting the safeguards in place. The continuing rolling back of safeguards cannot be. And what I've always said is, if we can do this, and we can do it safely, I feel like we have a responsibility to do that. If we can't, we should not. And that's the process we're in. Let's get to some questions from our audience. Derek in Minneapolis is on the mic. Hey, Derek, what's on your mind? Good morning. Good to see you, Governor. Good to see you, Derek. Um, so, um, so kind of sticking with the trade uh, stuff. So with the stock market in chaos and all that, and with fears of a possible recession next year, I'm curious what you and Peggy have in mind to prevent Minnesota going into an economic downturn. Yeah. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. Governor. Who I might add is with us today. Where are you? Uh, uh, Hello, Lieutenant Governor. A partner in justice there. No, you're, you're exactly right. And I think economic indicators show us that. Uh, history shows us that after the longest period of expansion, after the Great Recession, that, that things will slow down. I think they're being exacerbated by, by decisions in trade wars. And I think it is irresponsible of us not to be prepared in the state of Minnesota. One of the things that the state has done that was really smart after the last Great Recession is we have a rainy day fund. That is why we have a AAA bond rating. We have about $2 billion dollars in reserve to make sure that we're there. Minnesota has traditionally and historically not gone as low during recessions and not come up as quite as fast because of our diversified economy, because of an agricultural sector, because of a manufacturing sector, because of a mining sector, of all the different sectors where one was down, the other was up. This one's different, though, because it's striking at the heart of what was usually consistent, food production and agricultural trade. So I think for us to prepare in this next supplemental budget to be thoughtful, um, I think we need to think about those investments. I made the case last year that, that we should protect our <coughs> capital assets by investing in bonding, that we should keep our transit system and our transportation system the world best so that we can continue to attract and build. But I think irresponsible of us not to have rainy day fund, irresponsible of us not to realize that our diversified economy is the way we have to continue to go, but then it's irresponsible uh, to conduct a trade war in a manner that fluctuates all over the place. Because again, we can, you can say all you want, but there's two sides to every negotiation. And in this case, the Chinese, and I've been saying this, I, for some of your folks here, but your listeners, I had the privilege of being part of the first group of American high school teachers to teach in China in the 1980s. I've gone back about three dozen times. The one thing I can tell you is China's patience is great and they're not worried about the next election. And so getting in a trade war with China is a very iffy proposition. So we're preparing here, but I, I, I don't say that to scare people. I say that it's irresponsible. Hope is the most powerful word in the universe. Right. I hope a recession doesn't happen. It is not a plan. We have a plan. Ashley from St. Paul has a question. Ashley, while you make your way to a mic, let me ask you a question, Governor, about just the nature of this state government. Currently, Minnesota is the only state that's got a split legislature. Democrats control the House, Republicans control the Senate, and I'm sure everything gets along A-OK. -okay. <laughs> How do you do that? We can't do it in Congress. How do you do yeah. it in St. Paul? We did it here. Um, we came up with a two-year budget. Uh, we took us one extra day to get that done. Uh, for the first time in 41 years. Uh, now, can we just eradicate one? Is, is it because, it, can we blow the Minnesota nice thing out of the water? Because if it's just because Minnesotans are nicer, then that means that there's nothing we can possibly learn in D.C. because we're not that nice. You can learn to be nicer, I think. I don't, <laughs> I, have I you think, been to D.C.? I, no, I have, have been, been to D.C. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, I do think there's a part of that. I think there was a realism involved. And I think that, again, call it what you may, 
Minnesota nice or Minnesota pragmatism, there was an understanding that with state government, there, with split government, there's a couple ways to go. We could, we could model on DC and become dysfunctional and yell, or we could decide that compromise was a virtue, not a vice, and find some places to go, hold the line on key issues. We got it done. First time in 41 years, a governor didn't issue a veto during that time. We have AAA bond rating. We were able to invest uh, historically in education, and we kept something that Minnesota was known for, a 30-year plan on the health care access fund that has Minnesota have the highest amount of people insured and has the best health care outcomes, especially for our children. And so we did that together. I and I think it's finding that compromise. And I got to say, before we get to Amy's question, just briefly, I think you also have the benefit in state government that you have to get certain things done. Like you have no choice but to pass budgets and to patch potholes because you will go back to your districts and the people sitting right here will be sitting five feet away from you saying, I voted for you. What happened? No, that's right. And, and I always I always stress this, if there's no moral peril or if the voters don't either reward or punish people for behavior that is counter in, you know, to what they want to see done, and, and stressing that and, and engaging people in the process and trying. I don't want to paint a picture here that this is perfect. It was a pretty ugly ending. It was truly the sausage making, if you will. You don't want to know how the sausage was made, but it was pretty <laughs> tasty sausage when it was done. But I'm certainly not. Just to be clear. I'm happy we were able to get done, but I'm deeply dissatisfied that we didn't have a conversation on gun safety, that we didn't have a conversation on the environment, that we didn't have a conversation on paid family leave. So just so you know, it came at a sacrifice. I, I certainly want to continue to push those issues, but with an understanding, we got pretty good things done, but with more work to do. Ashley from St. Paul is at the mic. Ashley, what's on your mind? Hi, Governor Walls. Hi, Ashley. Just as you mentioned, gun safety. I'm a mom of two. You're a father of two. Uh, what are you going to do to keep Minnesota's children safe from guns? Yeah. I'll tell you what's not the solution, both as a father of a 12-year-old, a 20-year public school teacher is, uh, bulletproof backpacks are not the solution. Hardening the perimeter, uh, that I served in the military for 20 years. That's a military term. What we need to do to understand here is, is that the states who have taken, and I say this as a lifelong hunter, I... Uh, I say this as the three-time congressional top gun in trap shooting type of thing. I have been around these. I know them. But I also know that it does not infringe upon your Second Amendment rights to have a background check. We've done this and make sure there's no loopholes. It doesn't infringe upon your Second Amendment rights. I'm out here. The governor of Florida and the governor of Arizona were able to pass red flag laws that most of us knows that will prevent deaths in our family from suicides. And, and those happen in rural areas. What we have proposed is both of those things. I did not even get a hearing on those. They were not even heard. So I'm making the case that we should do a special session on insulin and insulin affordability and gun safety. And if we could do that in one day, we could come back. These things are supported by 80% of Minnesotans. We could pass them, sign them into law. But that gives us a start point. I want to be clear. That's not going to do everything. One of the things we know, especially in schools, that works is, is when every single child feels belonging and welcome there. So when people talk about school safety, don't think razor wire. Think counselors. Think ways to get people involved in extra activities. Think about each of that child and their family in a way that gets them involved. And that's what we're focusing on. We're not looking at this in pieces. We're looking at it holistically. Let me ask a connected question to that because you mentioned suicide deaths. It's important to note that most gun deaths in Minnesota, like the rest of the country, are by suicide. The Minnesota's Department of Health reported in 2017 there were 465 firearm deaths in the state. 365 were suicides. That's about three out of four. Talk about the larger strategy around mental health in Minnesota. There are a number of mental health challenges, including with people who work in farms and agriculture, people who have access to firearms, mental health issues. What's the larger strategy to deal with mental health? Yeah, two things. I'd like to note the, our Minnesota Department of Health uh, Commissioner Jan Malcolm is with us today. Those of you who know her, she's a leader, national leader on this. And I want to be clear because this is an area that, that is near and dear to my heart. I served as the ranking member of the VA committee as we were dealing with veterans' mental health. And to listen to the complexity of this, this gun argument in mental health, first of all, I will not allow uh, the, the scapegoating, if you will, or the stigmatization of people with mental health as the gun issue on this because most people with mental health are victims of gun violence. They're not the perpetrators of this. But here's what happened. In the VA... If you had a fiduciary assigned to you 
and that fiduciary might be designed because the VA thought you might not be capable of paying your bills or something like that, they automatically put an order in and took away your firearms. Now, it had best intentions, but what it ended up doing was it ended up driving veterans away because none of them would say they wanted to seek mental health counseling because they were afraid they would be stigmatized as violent and lose their firearms. And so what we need to do is, with an acknowledgement on this, the mental health piece is not a direct correlation to the violence, but what we do know in states that have extreme protective orders and the families have the ability to use the judicial system not to take away anybody's due process, we're able to take that firearm out of that that hand at the time of crisis and in many cases get beyond that move forward and reestablish. So we're looking at changing this conversation, but, but I have to tell you, I, I take great offense to this isn't a gun issue, it's a mental health issue, because that is wrong on many, many fronts. It stigmatizes those folks with mental health and it doesn't get us at that. And I would close with this, that I go back to this because I served in Congress, I voted for the ACA knowing that it was improving lives. I stand by that because it expanded, if many of you know, right here with Senator Wellstone's work in mental health parity. Those people who say that it's not a gun issue, it's a mental health issue, and also voted for the repeal of the, the ACA, takes away the very mental health treatment they're saying they're trying to claim. Here in Minnesota, we won't do that. I think Commissioner Malcolm's work of, of knowing where we start with the facts and then move from there is making sure that every single Minnesotan has access to quality, affordable mental health care right. holistically. Let's get John from Spring Valley to the mic. While he's making his way forward, Jonathan has a question that's kind of connected to some of what we've been talking about so far. Jonathan asks, how do you apply your experience as a veteran to your role as governor? Governor. You've talked some about that, but could you expand on that? Yeah, I, I think I apply it first of all, and those of you who serve know this, and I, I can't speak recently. I retired in, in 2005 after 24 years. I was an artilleryman. Um, that's kind of the purest, purest form of democracy. And don't get me wrong. As, as a first sergeant, I, I didn't do a lot of democracy, those when you're issuing orders and doing things. But there was a sense of common purpose, common mission, and there was a real sense of assessing the problem, gathering the evidence, creating courses of action, agreeing on them, and then going forward. Many of those times, my course of action wasn't the one the commander accepted. At that point in time, I pivoted directly, 100% bought in, and the execution of that. And what we ended up doing, and I would say this in many cases, oh, the commander was right, that is great. Applying it to government, of bringing everybody in and having an honest effort at looking at solving problems. Here in Minnesota, we, we had, and I know they're gonna, there's people here who have this, we had problems getting our driver's license system up up to grade. And and it's frustrating because this is a state that prides Did that just draw itself. a bad memory for a bunch of people? Oh. Over? Yeah, I can feel DMV, this wave of like, the oh. DMV you know but but we have a pride of, of expect expectations of delivering this and for numerous reasons and and this happens in the private sector too. software complications we came together Democrats and Republicans and Republicans who told me I'll never give you another penny for that ended up helping me craft a solution and they did give more than a penny as many of here know um, but we'll get that right and I think that experience in the military about bringing folks together and it is much more of a collaborative problem solving than people might see. What changes is, once we decide in the military, there's a concerted effort to, to execute that rather than trying to work against this because too much in politics now, everything is spent. I mean, here we are. Remember the promise that the ACA, they were gonna pull that out on day one and give you something better? And then they said, who knew it would be this hard? I don't say that to, to belittle the president or Republicans, right. I say it because it was a stupid statement that all of us know this is really hard and we're gonna have to work together to get that solution. We're gonna get to a question from John in Spring Valley in a moment. Also, we got a question for the Lieutenant Governor that we'd like to get to you about hey. regarding affordable housing. We'll get to some more of your questions here in the audience and wherever you are, 1A at WAMU.org. And there's a particular controversy here at the Minnesota State Fair that I need you to weigh in on that fans of corn dogs might not appreciate. We will get to that in just a minute. Stay close. Back now to our conversation with Minnesota Governor Tim Walls, and we are now joined by the Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan. Lieutenant Governor, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. We'll get to some questions for you. One particular question that came in for both of you. We'll get to that in a minute, but first, John in Spring Valley is at the mic, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can in the time we've got left. John, what's on your mind? Thank you both for being here and providing us some hope face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. 
What, speaking of hope, where, is, where do we stand with the gas tax, a common sense gas tax that would, uh, I assume, directly go to our crumbling infrastructure? Before you answer, can I just say that I'm glad you asked this question, John, because this is one of those things that bedevils a lot of states, even states like, say, California, which are revenue rich and overflowing with surpluses. It's still one of those nasty fights where this penny goes to that project. And it's the kind of thing that I think a lot of governors have just never quite figured out. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I made it clear. Our infrastructure is, is key when you're, you're in a state like Minnesota and, and the weather's harder. Climate's harder on our on roads, and I think what many people don't recognize is the economic vitality was by investments that were made in our infrastructure. We have the fifth highest amount of road miles of any state in the nation. We're on the par with states like California, Texas, Pennsylvania, and it takes upkeep, even though our population is smaller than those. And the gas tax is a constitutionally dedicated uh, source of revenue for roads and bridges, we had a comprehensive package that understands that transit is a key role in our future of efficiently moving people, and I think it was irresponsible. I, my pro tip of the day for all of you is I ran for governor on raising the tax and, and telling people honestly what it was going to take to do it to dedicate for that. Now, there's a school of thought that says, yeah, there's surplus. We have, we have extra. Use that to start pulling it from the general fund. Then you get a recession, and then there's no money for health care or education or mental health care, whatever it might be. And I made the argument that Minnesota's uh, 28 and a half cents. The federal government has been frozen for 30 years. No one wants to do it. And we are at a place where if we don't do it, the cost is passed on to future generations. The cost we're paying right now is less of our income that we take home than any other generations of Minnesotans. And I think it just makes sense to invest, to be smart, to plan for a future where we have electric vehicles and driverless cars, where we have a transit system that moves us towards zero emissions. Those are things that now we have to do it. And you can't promise people something and not pay for it. So you've got folks telling you, oh yeah, we don't need to do this, it'll fix itself. So I'm gonna make the case, tell me. And, and this is frustrating to me. I had Mike DeWine out here from Ohio trying to figure out how to make the Ohio State Fair a really good one. He came out and visited the Minnesota State Fair. Mike DeWine has a Republican House, a Republican Senate. He's a Republican governor. He passed a gas tax this year because of the necessity of fixing the roads. So I will advocate for whatever it takes to get to do that and make the case to Minnesotans that this is actually a money saver. You're already spending the money caught in traffic. So... I think we need to. That's something that was left on the table. And I think as governor, one of the responsibilities is responsibly use taxpayer dollars to improve the lives of people. This is a safety issue and an environmental issue. Let me come to Lieutenant Governor Flanagan for a few questions. Deb in St. Paul asked, I appreciate you, you Governor Walls, and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's initiative for One Minnesota. Affordable housing is a huge growing need. What is being done statewide on this issue? I should note we had a conversation on this just yesterday as part of 1A Across America, but that's more from a local Minneapolis perspective. Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, what's the state doing? Sure. So I, I'm really grateful for this question because this is something that we hear consistently when we travel across the state. One of the initiatives uh, that we moved forward uh, this past legislative session um, was to increase bonding for housing by $180 uh, million. We got $90 million, so we're halfway to great. Um, but there's, there's certainly additional um, things that we need to do, and we will continue to advocate for additional dollars to go uh, towards housing. But you know, what we see in Minnesota is a real need um, to talk about the entire spectrum of housing, from emergency shelter uh, to transitional housing uh, to uh, affordable housing through uh, rentals, but also um, making sure that people can, can buy homes. Um, and that's been a, a huge obstacle for, for a lot of folks. We are on a pathway um, to uh, eliminate veterans' homelessness in Minnesota, and I think that's something that we can be really proud of. Of, but we also have to look at the issue of family homelessness um, and the, uh, the issues that are underlying a lot of the things that people experiencing homelessness face every day, that of mental health um, issues, health care issues, and um, 
you know, we spent uh, some time uh, about a month and a half ago uh, visiting shelters, talking directly to people who are experiencing homelessness, and also uh, visiting some encampments under bridges. And the, the number one thing that we heard from people was lack of access to mental health care and lack of access uh, to treatment um, for, uh, for chemical addiction. So those are, we can't, people don't come in pieces. We have to look at this issue holistically, and that's, that's what we're working on now. I also wanted to follow up with you because you were on our program just a few months ago uh, in a program we did about uh, Native American women who had taken elective office. You're a member of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe. You are the highest ranking Native woman in executive office in American history. And, and I wonder how you see the impact of Native women thus far. It's, it's early going yet, yeah, but how do you see that in terms of what the expectations were with Sharice Davids and, and Deb Holland and yourself and how is that kind of compared to reality? So um, I love this question. And I love this question because Native women have been leaders since time immemorial. It is just contemporary society that's like catching up. Um, and so, you know, this last uh, election, uh, we had Native women running and winning across the country. This is not a flash in the pan. This is just what's going to happen. Um, 20 years ago, Native people were making the difference in the Native a vote, but now we're running for office and we're winning and we are setting policy at the table. It makes a tremendous difference that Congresswoman Deb Holland uh, serves in D.C. and Congresswoman uh, Sharice Davids. Uh, they are my sisters in this struggle and we talk very often. Um, frankly, because we are part of systems that weren't created by us or for us. And in many uh, instances, were created to eliminate us. And so it is working within those systems to change those systems. Um, but it's not new that Native women are leading. But you can see the impact within uh, the presidential debate that was on issues in Indian country. Um, my expectation and the expectation for Native folks across the country should be that candidates are ready to talk about treaty rights, tribal sovereignty and understand that we are contemporary people and our issues deserve to be addressed. Also, there's the matter of, I think there's also the matter of voter access with regards Absolutely. to voter registration requirements where many people on reservations have PO boxes mm -hmm. and there are rules that are requiring them more often to have a physical address, which has the potential to disenfranchise a number of voters. We got time for a few more questions. Pam in Minneapolis, from Minneapolis, had a question. Pam, while you make your way to the mic, let me get to a question from Heather, who wrote on our Facebook page, my 25-year-old has a marijuana felony. What ideas are being developed for these marijuana felons who really just need medical help instead of incarceration? Governor Walls? Yeah, well, we ran on this too. A prohibition doesn't work. Uh, the state can, can do a much better job. We know, especially as it deals with... Uh, with the person who wrote in with, with their child, uh, that these are uh, very skewed. Uh, the convictions skew racially uh, to a point that is beyond embarrassment. There simply uh, cannot happen. We've made proposals to do this right, to make sure that there is an orderly transition to adults making choices on, uh, on legal cannabis. And then part of that proposal was that there would be an expectation there would be an expungement of these records to let people start fresh, to get going on things that set them back and in many cases change the trajectory of their lives where others uh, simply weren't put into that position. So I, I think it just makes sense. And I don't, I just want to be clear, I don't underestimate any addiction. I don't underestimate anything that, that could be considered a vice, but I also don't think turning a blind eye and, and not even, again, having this conversation and pretending it's not going to happen, um, I, I can tell you if, if people want to buy marijuana, they can buy it now. That, that <laughs> happens. It makes sense to me that people would know what they're buying, that it would be controlled, and that we would be making a real effort on education using those dollars to, to focus and then correct the, uh, the social injustice that has been inflicted, especially on communities of color. Speaking of buying marijuana, where do you stand on legalization of recreational cannabis? We're, I support it. The Lieutenant Governor and I have are put together a plan that um, makes sense. We don't take this lightly. Uh, Health Commissioner is doing the work and, and putting in there. Again, I, I don't take this lightly, and I, I understand the, uh, the juxtaposition against a problem we're seeing here across the country and 
specifically in Minnesota on some, is vaping and some unexplained deaths, things like that. So this is not a cognitive dissonance with us that we think like anything, whether it's tobacco or alcohol, legalized gambling or, or cannabis. But what we do know is, is the prohibition on this has wreaked havoc uh, in certain communities. It has not moved us any closer to the reduction of usage. It puts things on the streets that people don't know what they have and fuels a black market that, that does not benefit the state in any way. I think we got time for one more audience question from Pam from Minneapolis. Pam, what's on your mind? First, I want to say I love your program every day. I love my uh, governor and lieutenant governor. Thank you very, very much. My question is this. We are at the breaking point with the climate crisis. There is no more time. We have no help from the federal government. I want to know specifically what the state of Minnesota is going to do to reverse climate crisis in our state. Yeah. Well. And, and we can do this together. We, we're in full agreement with you. We put out a proposal that would have mirrored Hawaii and California in making Minnesota where it's always been a leader in moving towards a zero carbon in our electrical generation grid. We are preparing to try to do some things on uh, low emission vehicles to put us in uh, touch with some of the most aggressive ways to fight that. We are looking at ways in everything that we proposed in our budget from food waste reduction that is a part of climate that goes into it to research dollars at the University of Minnesota because I hate that this is a reality, but it is. We've got to start thinking mitigation because that window is closing. At the same time, we start think about ways that we can start to reverse and certainly stop this. So the irresponsibleness of pulling out of the Paris Accords, I voted for that as a member of Congress. I voted for cap and trade, fully knowing that in southern Minnesota's first district, I was could have been sent home, but I was not going to at that time go look at my two-year-old and my seven-year-old and have them know that I didn't do a darn thing when the evidence is right in front of us, the window is closed. Closing. And I can tell you, think about this. Just 12 years ago in here in Minnesota, I sat in a church in New Ulm with uh, Bishop Chilstrom. I sat in there with Will Steger, the polar explorer, and I sat in there with former Governor Paul Enney. And we were all there, and I was a member of Congress, working together to address this as Minnesota put in a stringent renewable standard that, guess what? The critics said that'll kill our economy and we'll never get there. We exceeded it and our economy grew. So we're going here in Minnesota. We're not waiting for the federal government. But the two of us are in full agreement with you. It's an existential threat that's going to take all of us to move on. One last real, real quick political question. Randall emails, what's the path a Democratic candidate will have to take to win the presidency? In other words, what issues will attract voters in states in the Midwest so that a Democrat can win in the Electoral College in 2020? Lieutenant Governor Flanagan? Sure. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with uh, meeting people where they're at. We have a lot of conversations about apathy and apathetic voters and folks who turn out and those who don't. I think the reason that the people don't get engaged and involved in, in politics is because folks aren't actually talking or speaking to the issues that affect real people's lives. So um, meeting people where they're at, building relationships, learning about things you don't know, and knowing that the best solutions come from communities themselves, that we don't need people to bring solutions in. We have to talk to directly to folks who are, who are most affected by that. And I think um, that is the path way forward. We might not always agree um, on things, but we can have respectful dialogues based on values. And I don't know about y'all, but I am ready for those kind of conversations yeah, right please. now. We should have them everywhere. We should... Democrats should go into every VFW and talk about why the investments in the in veterans' health care made a difference, why these things matter. We should feel and go back into every of those houses of worship and understand that the place of the sense of creation or the sense of spiritualness that we share, we should not be afraid to talk about those things. We should go into every community, as the uh, lieutenant governor said, listen and gain, gain confidence and trust amongst those communities that we can do this together. There's one more question that we wanted to make sure that we asked before we went, and this may be the biggest political controversy at the fair. Um, I had never heard of a Pronto Pup before I came to Minnesota. There might be a reason for that. There might be. I've heard, I, I thought I was educated, I thought I was educated. I have heard of a corn dog. Yeah. Now, the batter recipes, as I understand it, are they're, they're pretty similar, but the difference is in the sweetness, like corn dogs have it and pronto pups don't. So I have to ask you both, before our time is up, and your re-election may depend on this, <laughs> corn dogs yes. or pronto pups? Lieutenant Governor. Pronto pups. So the pronto pups all the way. But here's the deal. Corn dog, pronto pup. 
our powers combined, one that's Minnesota. one Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I'm team corn dog. <laughs> this is the quintessence of Minnesota night. <laughs> All those in favor of Prano Pups say aye. aye. All those in favor of corn dogs say aye. 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 Oh, Don't burn down the. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, look. <laughs> Uh, first of all, let me just say that I love that this is a debate in Minnesota. <laughs> yes. I think this is one of those only in Minnesota things. And I am also very grateful that, to your last point, Lieutenant Governor, that we are able to have these kinds of pragmatic conversations. For those of you who are not here, you should see that the crowd of people who has come out for this pragmatic conversation has grown through the hour. So Minnesota is proving that it can be done. A state led by, by Governor Tim Walls and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. Lieutenant Governor, Governor, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having Thank us. You. This conversation job, was produced by Stacia Brown and 1A's team in Minnesota, Amanda Williams, James Morrison, Catherine Fink, and Danielle Knight. Big thanks to Minnesota Public Radio for hosting us here at the State Fair today, with a special shout-out to NPR's political editor, Michael Mulcahy, for his help. 1A Across America is a collaboration funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You can learn more and share your thoughts online at the1a.org slash across America. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you so much for listening. And we will see you tomorrow for the Friday News Roundup. This is 1A.